But I don't want to review for too long. I want to finish up with this. The Bible says in Ephesians, the second chapter, in the first verse, and Brother Mike said something Tuesday night when he preached. And it was just in passing. He didn't even really mean it in the direction, I guess, that I ran with it. But he said something, and because the Lord had my train of thought, Brother Sleece going along these lines and was leading me in this direction, it caused me to jump all over it. And uh, you know, I'll tell you what it was in a minute. First, I want to read our scripture that we've been talking about, Ephesians, the second chapter, the first verse. Ephesians 2 and 1 says, And you hath he quickened, who were dead in trespasses and sins. My, 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 we once were dead. Amen. Hallelujah. Like the prodigal son, the Bible says that his father said, This is my son who was dead and now is alive. Well, the same can be said about you. You were dead in trespasses and sins, and you were brought to life whenever you became born again by the blood of Jesus. And Paul's talking to people here. We've been reading this, and I've made mention of this probably 30 or 40 times since we've been talking about it, but he's talking about those ways that we used to have, the things that we used to do, the way that we used to think, the conversation that we used to have. And now he's talking to, he's talking to us how we used to be and how we're supposed to be now. He's telling the Ephesians here, wherein in times past you walked according to the course of this world. <laughs> According to the prince of the power of the air, the spirit that now worketh in the children of disobedience used to work in you, is what Paul's saying. You used to be the same way. Hallelujah. You ain't supposed to be that way no more. Our conversation's supposed to be different. Our train of thought's supposed to be different. And I know we still wrestle with those things. But to just pass it off and say, well, I'm not perfect. Nobody's perfect. We all have sin. All that is is a cop-out because we don't want to deal with our old stinking flesh that tries to take over and not allow our spirit to rule in our life. Amen? And we're talking about having the mind of Christ, and that's essentially that's what Paul was telling them here. He was talking about the war that he made mention of more than once in his own life. How that whenever he wanted to do the good thing, it seemed like he wound up doing the bad or whatever. You know, it was always a struggle there. And he said, there, I, found, I find in me that when I want to do good, uh, evil is present with me. It's, it's like there's a battle that's going on, and there was. And he was trying to tell us that when you become born again, you don't become sanctified and perfect overnight. Amen? Hallelujah. There's still a lot of your old flesh that's in you that you have. You, it'll pop its old head up, and then you'll have to deal with it. Amen? Your old attitudes and the things that you used to say that you can't say anymore, the places you used to go that you won't go, want to go anymore because your spiritual man's pulling you in one direction in your flesh, and, and the carnal mind, which we learned last week, which is enmity with God, is pulling you in the other direction. So we know that there's a battle that's going on, but the, the, we, and that's a fact. But the sad part of it is, is that many times, the flesh is winning the battle. And usually it's because, most of the time in people's lives, it's because they do not have a revelation of the Word of God to realize. Listen, I know people that when they were saved, they were all excited. They were all fired up and they said, you know, I'm born again, I'm saved, I'm going to live for the Lord. And in a few days, maybe not a few days, maybe that night or the next day, they messed up. And they thought, you know, I must have not got saved after all. I must not got what Brother Sleece has. I must not have what Sister Vonnie has. I must not have what Brother Rodney has because I know that they don't do that no more. Yeah, well, there's a growing up in God. There is a spiritual maturity to be taken place. When you're born in the natural life, as Jesus said, born, born of the water, you don't automatically begin to talk and read and write and all of that. It's, there's a growing process and it's the same way in the Spirit as well. When you're born again spiritually, you don't automatically just begin to take off and walk. There's falling down, and you're going to yeah. skin your knees, and you're going to bump your nose, and you're going to bump your head, and you're going to have those times. Listen, <laughs> I'm, not, I'm still bumping my head, yeah. amen? I'm still skinning my knees, hallelujah. But I know that I know that I know that Christ in me is the hope of glory, and that there is that new man inside of me that wants to do good all the time, and my old flesh that don't want to do good, and that battle that's going on, and it's my job 
to feed the one that I want to be the strongest. Amen? If you take two men and you take care of one of them and you feed one of them and you nourish one of them and, you, and they begin to get stronger, well, which one you think is going to win the battle if you're starving the other one to death? That is the problem with most Christians and their battle against the flesh today is because we spend six days a week feeding our flesh and one day a week feeding our spiritual man. Amen? And it just stands to reason. It's just common sense. We can understand today that the one that you feed, the one that you nurture, the one that is the strongest is the one that will rule your life. And when we get down to that, we know where that leads us. That takes us back to our sin series that we preached about for so many weeks. That sin, when it is finished, your flesh, when it is finished, if it is allowed to be strengthened, if it is allowed to be stronger, if it is allowed to rule, if it is allowed to have its way, sin, when it is finished, will bring forth death. Your flesh, when it is finished, will lead you to hell. There is a way that seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. Talking about our old carnal mind. That's what we talked about last week. We talked about losing our mind. We talked about having the mind of Christ. Paul said in Philippians 2 and 5, let this, let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. And we talked about what kind of mind did Jesus have. It was not a selfish mind. It was not a self-centered mind. It was not one of greed. It was not a political mindset, Brother Sleeves. It was not a religious mindset. But it was, he said, if you've seen me, you've seen the Father. It was the mind of God. It was the mind of the Father. Jesus had a mind of compassion. Jesus had a mind that whenever he walked past someone that was hurting, his heart reach out to them. He couldn't just go on by and say, well, I'm too busy today. I don't have time. I'm scared. Like I told you last week about the woman, the Samaritan woman at the well. He couldn't just say, I can't go through Samaria. No, because he felt the unction. He knew that somebody there was going to show up at that well that needed salvation. So he laid his own wants and his own desires and his own safety aside and he went to the Jacob's well in Samaria and he, he talked to that woman that had been so confused and jumping from one man to another and finally she got a hold of the living water. Why? Because the mind of Christ was concerned enough about her to go out of his way even probably against the wishes of his disciples because Samaritans were enemies with the Jews and Jews were enemies with the Samaritans. So probably even against the will of his brothers there, I'm talking spiritually, his disciples, his followers, more than likely he went against their will. Why? Because of his mind. And Paul said, let this mind which was in Christ Jesus be also in you. He talks about us taking heed to the cares of others over ourselves. He talks about how that Jesus who we know was God in the flesh took on Himself the form of a servant. He humbled Himself and became obedient unto death. We talked about how that Jesus the King of kings and the Lord of lords, Alpha and Omega, the very one that treaded upon the, the coals of fire in the fiery furnace with the Hebrew children, the one that spoke out of the burning bush, the one that was there in the beginning whenever God said, let there be light. We talked about how that this man that was 100% man but 100% God lowered himself to the form of a servant and washed his disciples' feet. I told you last week, I'll tell you again today, there was no competition for the position that Jesus was trying to take. Mm -hmm. he, he made Himself of no reputation. Oh, but we spend our whole life trying to build up our reputation. <clears throat> we spend our whole life, man does, in general, fighting for the top to be the top dog when Jesus took the worm's road and humbled Himself as a servant. Mm -hmm. He was unselfish. He never preached a self-centered gospel. That's how far off the mark you can tell the message of today is. Whenever you hear about your best life now, when you hear about you can be all you need to be, and that if you'll think yourself, if you'll think positive, and if you'll think all of this, you can have everything that you want. None of that comes from Jesus. He was unselfish. He did not live a self-centered life. We find Him serving others. We find Him loving others. We find Him forgiving others. 
And we find Him doing all of this, as we said last week, without compromise. We touched on that last week. We've got to move on. He didn't preach the power of positive thinking. He didn't preach the power of your words. Not in the sense that it's being preached today. He preached about the power of God. As a matter of fact, the Bible says that the preaching of the cross is the power of God. So we know that Jesus and His mind, His mind was spiritual. It was not on the things of the world. He didn't spend His 33 and a half years trying to build up His business. He didn't spend His 33 and a half years trying to get a great education. He didn't spend His 33 and a half years trying to lay up treasures so that He could leave them for Mama once He passed on. He spent His 33 and a half years making Himself of no reputation, caring about others over Himself, giving His life for those that could care less about Him. As a matter of fact, they hated Him, but He gave His life anyway. You see how far our carnal mind is from the mind of Christ? That's why the Bible says that the carnal mind is enmity with God. It is an enemy with God. The Bible says in Romans 8 and 7, because the carnal mind is enmity against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither, neither indeed can be. Your natural mind cannot see through the eyes of faith, but your spiritual man can. We learned last week that the Bible says, I have not seen, ear hath not heard, neither has it entered into the heart of man. What God has in store for His people, but Paul didn't stop there. He said, but God has revealed these things to us. How? Through the Spirit. We're talking about having the mind of Christ. We're talking about loosening our old carnal mind that is enmity with God. That brings me to what Brother Mike said Tuesday night. And you're probably going to look at me like I fell out of a well. Not that you ain't already doing that. But Mike said something Tuesday night about being committed. I don't even remember what he was talking about. He was probably talking about you know being devoted. Because that was, went along with his lines of his, of his message. He was talking about being a, a more or less a casual Christian. Or you know an uncommitted one or being a committed one. But when he said that, it struck a chord in me. And I got to thinking about what do they do someone in the natural, in the regular world as we see it, what do they do to someone when they lose their mind? That person becomes committed. Amen? Committed to an insane asylum, of course, but that ain't where my mind went with this. When we lose our mind, whenever we take on the mind of Christ, we will become committed to Him. Amen? We will become committed to Him, to His work, to the things of God. We won't have any trouble then writing out our check for our tithes. We won't try to think, what well, can I afford to pay my tithes? Because see, that's your carnal mind. That's enmity with God. Your, your mind, the mind of Christ, your spiritual mind says, I can't afford not to. Amen? So our carnal mind cannot comprehend the things of God. But if we can lose as much of that as possible, I know we got to keep a little bit of it, not as much of it as we have, amen? But if we can get as much of the mind of Christ, hallelujah, as He allows to have, at, at, at least to the depth that we're in, to the place we're at, if we begin to take on His mind and lose, on our, lose our mind, then we will become committed. And I got to looking up the word committed. And I got to seeing how it, it associated itself with being addicted. The word being addicted means to determine, it means to ordain, it means to set. And of course we know all about addictions in the church and world as we know it today. Amen? We got people addicted to prescription drugs, we got people addicted to cigarettes, we got people addicted to, addicted to tobacco, we got people addicted to booze and alcohol, we've got people addicted to pornography, we've got people addicted to gossip on the telephone, we've got people addicted to books, we've got people addicted to television, we've got people addicted to the things of the world, but how many people do you know are addicted to the things of God? And I find this word only one time in your King James Bible, and he's talking about some people that had became addicted. And he's admonishing other people to be the same way. You say, Brother Billy, what in the world could they have been addicted to that Paul would want other people to be the same way? You know, you don't look at somebody and say, you know, they're addicted to heroin. Brother please, I hope you get addicted. You don't look at somebody and say, well, they're addicted to alcohol. Brother Rodney, I sure hope you get addicted to alcohol. No, but Paul looked at these people and he saw they were addicted to something. And he looked at this other group and he said, I hope you get the same way. 1 Corinthians 16 and 15. 
I beseech you, brethren, you know the house of Stephanus, that it is the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have addicted themselves to the ministry of the saints. Then he says that you submit yourselves unto such, and to everyone that helpeth us and laboreth. In other words, what he was saying is, I see the house of Stephanus. They have addicted themselves. Apparently they had lost their mind. Amen. They had became addicted to the ministry of the saints. And Paul looks at these people here. And he says over here in Corinthians, to the people of Corinth, he says, I want you to be the same way that they are. Get addicted. Become addicted to the ministry of the saints. What was he talking about? The same thing that he was telling over, telling us over here when he said, let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ Jesus. Look not after your own things, but care about the things of the others, of other people. Take care of others. Don't allow your bowels of compassion to be constipated, amen, and, and to be clogged up to where you can't have compassion on other people. Let this mind be in you that was in Christ Jesus. Become addicted to something besides television, amen. Become addicted to something besides books. Become addicted to something besides drugs or alcohol. Become addicted to the ministry today and ministering to other people and their needs. That is the mind of Christ. The mind of Christ is ministering to others. It's not self-centered. It's not all about me, mine, and everything i got. I, me, my, my, myself, and I. It's all about helping others and doing the will of God. That's what Jesus was all about. When He walked this earth, that was his mindset. That was what... And you say, Brother Billy, I can't hardly grasp this. Oh, you can grasp it if you look into the Word because this is what he's teaching us. Paul, when he talks about putting off the old man and putting on the new, when he talks about old things have passed away and all things have became new, he's talking about the change that took place in his mind. He's talking about the mind of Christ and the carnal mind that wars within him and he's talking about allowing... Christ to reign supreme in our life. And how does this take place? This takes place because we feed both. <clears throat> Listen to me. We feed both our spirit and our flesh. The question is, is which one are we feeding the most? Which one are we feeding the most? When we make decisions, do we make them with the mind of carnality which is enmity with God or we, do we seek for the mind of Christ in every situation every decision that we make Paul would talk more about this in Romans 12 Romans 12 in the first chapter I mean the first verse Romans 12 in the first verse I beseech you therefore brethren by the mercies of God that you present your bodies a living sacrifice Holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. And listen, boy, he says something here that this don't go along with today's church world at all. Romans 12 and 2. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Be not conformed to this world. The word conform means to put on the form, the fashion, or the appearance of another. How about that? The word conform means to put on the form, fashion, or appearance of another. We got a church world, you can't tell the difference between them and the world. It'd be, you'd be hard pressed to figure out who it is having the car wars. Because they all dress the same. Mm -hmm. I've seen churches holding up signs for their car wash and they've got teenage girls out there half dressed. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't know if it was the church doing it, if it was the pool hall that needed to raise some funds, if it was the, the Masonic Lodge, you'd have no idea mm -hmm. what was going on. Because we have conformed so much to the world. Listen, we've made sure our music sounds like the world so that we can win the world. We've made sure that our teens get the same kind of entertainment that the world gets so that we can win the teens. We've done all of these. We've got preachers that have preached on rooftops to try and fill their church on Sunday morning. They say, if we get 100 people here, I'll do some tricks for you. If we get 100 people here, I'll preach on the roof. If we get 100 people here, I'll dress in a chicken outfit. 
all the time trying to do the job of the Holy Spirit, which is to draw men. He said, if I be lifted up, I will draw men unto me. If we will put on the mind of Christ, if we will begin to lift Him up, if we will begin to minister one to another, then people will see in you something that they don't have and they will want what you've got instead of what they have. They don't need more people like chameleons latching on to everything of the world and becoming just like that to try and win them. The world already has won them. They need somebody to win them with something that they don't have. And Paul says don't be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind. He goes back to the mind here. You see, Paul knew what I told you last week. 99.9% .9 of your battle is in your head. It's in your mind. Have you heard people say, you know, they'll be talking about they're sick and they're hurting and somebody say, well, it's all in your head. Mm -hmm. That's where the spiritual battle's at. Mm -hmm. Is in your head. I told you last week, I'm going to read it to you today. I don't think we read it last week. Ephesians 6 and 10. Ephesians 6 and 10 says, Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of His might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to withstand the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. <coughs> now I told you that certainly there is a heavenly realm above us where battle goes on. You can find that in the Word of God. Someone said that, well, it's men in power, wicked men in power. You know, that's wickedness in high places, and you could see that too. But it don't take any stretch of the imagination to realize today that the battle, the highest place in your body, when you're standing up, the highest place is where your brain's at. The highest place is between your ears. The battlefield for you you people out there that's listening to me, the battle of fear that attacks you, where does it attack you? It attacks your mind. The battle of depression that comes against you, where does it attack you? It attacks your mind. That's why we've got more counselors and psychiatrists buying, buying bigger homes today off your money than ever before because there is such an attack of the mind. You know when the Bible says men's heart filling them for fear? We could say today men's minds filling them for fear. People going crazy, depressed and oppressed and, and, and people having nervous breaks and breakdowns. Why? Because Satan is attacking where he knows he can do the most harm and that's in your head. If he can get in your head, he has got you. At least he thinks he does anyway. If he can get in your head, he can do the most damage. How do people become deceived? He gets in their head. He gets in their mind. That's where the battlefield is at. It's in your mind. That's why Paul is talking about renewing your mind. That's why he's talking about putting on the mind of Christ. That's why he says here, Stand therefore, I skipped a verse, Wherefore take unto you the whole armor of God, that you may be able to withstand it in the evil day. And having done all to stand, stand therefore having your loins girt about with truth. Now we can see in 1 Peter where Peter admonishes us to have the loins of our mind girt about and to be sober. And then Paul talks about having our loins girt about with the truth today. He's talking about with the Word of God. David said, I will meditate on your Word. David said, I have hid your Word in my heart. Now what was he talking about, Brother Salise? Where is it that your memory comes from? It doesn't come from the organ that pumps the blood to the, all the other parts of your body comes from your mind. He said, I've hid your word. He said in, in his heart, he was talking about in his mind. That's where his memory was at. That's where the battlefield was at. That's where the, the, you use the artillery from. Whenever the enemy comes against you and says you can't, you say, I can. And how do you know that? Because you've hid that part of the word that I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me in your mind. So to have that arsenal in your mind of the word of God is, you have to have, it's like, if you don't know God's word, it's like a soldier going out on the battlefield with no weapons, no defense whatsoever. And Paul knows this. This is why he talks about renewing your mind. And how do you do that? By the washing of the water of the Word. By learning God's Word. By having it revealed to you by the Spirit 
of God. And I can give you a scripture after scripture for this. The Bible says in Philippians 4 and 8, if you want to write it down, Finally, brethren, whatsoever things are true, whatsoever things are honest, whatsoever things are just, whatsoever things are pure, whatsoever things are lovely, whatsoever things are of a good report, if there be any virtue, and if there be any praise, think on these things. Think on these things. <laughs> Paul's talking about our brain. He's getting and he's messing with our mind. Amen. Isaiah 26 and 3 says, That will keep him in perfect peace. Who, Brother Rodney? That will keep him in perfect peace whose mind is stayed on thee. Talking about the mind. Talking about the battle that goes on. Talking about whether we keep our mind on everything else or whether we keep our mind on Jesus. Whether we listen to the report of the world or whether we listen to the report of the Word of God. The Bible says in Proverbs 23 and 7, For as he thinketh in his heart, so is he. So if I meditate on the Word, if I think on the Word, if I hide his Word, and as someone once said, Jesus was the Word that became flesh. We need to be the flesh that becomes Word. The more we think on His Word, the more we meditate on His Word, the more we hide His Word in our heart. And I know you think you've heard this before, but I'm telling you, the closer we get to the end, the more this thing winds up, the stronger the warfare becomes in your mind and in your lives, the more you're going to need to rely upon the Word of God and the more you're going to need to know the Word of God for yourself. As a man thinketh in his heart, in his mind, so is he. And Peter tells us to gird up the loins of our mind. Paul tells us to gird up the loins, uh, to gird up our loins with truth, having on the breastplate of righteousness and your feet shod with the preparation of the gospel of peace. Above all, taking the shield of faith, wherewith you shall be able to quench all the fiery darts of the wicked, and take the helmet of salvation. Now, what's the helmet protect? Anybody tell me that this morning? I hope the mind. There you go. It goes right here. Mm -hmm. Amen. It's to protect your brain. Put on the helmet today. Oh, my goodness. I wish I had one made out of a Bible. Amen. Mm -hmm. Put on your helmet today. Amen. Gird your, the loins of your mind with truth today. Get the Word of God in your heart and your mind today so that whenever the wicked one attacks, when the warfare begins, you've got some ammunition. Amen? You've got a defense shield. Mm -hmm. You've got a defense shield. That's what the Word of God is. Thy Word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. I can't walk without it. I can't see where I'm going without it. It's my shield. It's my sword. It is my buckler. It says, take the helmet of salvation, the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Mm -hmm. I don't know how much plainer can get in that. Mm -hmm. He said, above all, take these things. And the last one he finished up with was the Word of God. The high places, the spiritual world, well, brother, we don't have any problems today. As a matter of fact, we got the church thinking better than ever before. Oh, yeah. Listen to me. When we've got preachers that go out to the grave sites of dead preachers that have been gone for 40 years to try and get in touch with their spirit, we've got a problem today. Amen. When we've got people, and I just read this, I ain't going to give you the name of the church, but in Knoxville, Tennessee, a United Methodist church, a Sunday school teacher using Harry Potter to teach her Sunday school class, we've got a problem. Mm -hmm. When we've got Christian parents that will allow their children to flock to movie theaters to watch Harry Potter, we have got a problem in the church today. Witchcraft, the occult, has become so accepted. That's how I know today that we have a problem. And the enemy knows it. He attacks the minds of our children through books, through movies, through toys, through games. And most of the time... <coughs> Christians just go around in a daze. So busy with work, so busy with school, we don't have time to make sure what the kids are playing or what it is that they're doing. As long as they're not in our hair, we don't care. Amen? When you have Christians that consult their horoscope on a daily basis to try and find out what their future holds, we've got a problem 
It's a spiritual problem and it begins in the mind. Amen? It's a spiritual problem and it's going on. There's a battle that's going on in the mind. 